Oh, my name is Josh Holmes. Hi. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> so th there's, there's a guy that, that I have tremendous respect for. Uh, his name is Jeff Proceis. Um, I don't know if, it, has anybody heard of Jeff Proceis? Name kind of ring a bell, a couple people in the back. Um, he was the founder of a company called Wintelec. They do high-end uh, technical training for developers. So, um, you know, it, it, and, and it in, in the, the Microsoft worlds, he's very famous. But uh, the reason I bring him up is that he used to do this thing where there's a little bit of a tinge right there. All right, I'll step back just a little bit. Uh, he used to do the thing that he called Adventures in Jet Lag which was, he, there was a conference every year in Germany called BASTA. And uh, he would fly in on the day, on the red eye, and do the opening talk for the conference. And it was whatever craziness came out of his head. And, 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 it was, and nobody knew what he was gonna say. He didn't know what he was gonna say. What he knew was he was gonna show up and talk, hopefully. And um, anyways, and I always looked at that and went, respect. And you're nuts. You're like, nobody should ever do that. Hi. <laughs> I just got off a plane at nine, uh, sorry, at eight o'clock. Uh, Paul was having a little bit of a panic attack a couple of days ago and was making backup plans and like, okay, maybe we can shift the keynoters around and you know, so on and so forth. I planned on being here Tuesday and, you know, but my, my new manager called a required meeting on Thursday and Friday in Boston. So I flew from Seattle to Boston. And then um, yesterday at four, I, I said, I gotta go. And I dropped everything and left and went to the airport and flew to Dublin and then flew, uh, flew to here. Um, and so I don't know what time zone I'm in. And I'm not a thousand percent sure what I'm gonna say today. Just warning you now. What I am gonna say is if I'm carrying this much energy after that, come on. <laughs> so let's, let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, here we are. Very good. So how many of you have heard of this thing called AI? How many of you think it's bullshit? <laughs> All right, good. Got a couple of doubters in the room. This is good. So um, my name is Josh Holmes. Um, oh, good. I remember to turn that on. Uh, so, so you can find me on the web. Um, you know, I'm obfuscated. Uh, I try to try to keep things quiet on the down low. So, uh, you know, JoshHolmes.com. Josh Holmes on uh, a lot of different platforms. Uh, Josh Holmes on Twitter. So feel free to tag me in all the photos and that kind of stuff. Prove to my boss that I actually came and talked at a cool and important conference here. Um, and actually, the, the way that I met Paul was uh, I spoke at, um, I'm guessing it was the predecessor of this conference called Whiskey Web. And um, I actually uh, talked at that one twice. And that was Phenomenal conference, and I knew that anything that Paul was going to be involved in was going to be a phenomenal conference. So, you know, drop everything to come up here. Um, and just, by the way, big hand to the organizers uh, for, for all the work that they're doing here. So, come on. So, and one of the things, you know, I, I don't, hopefully you guys know, because uh, I found this out in, in get the invitation to this, um, the organizers here are actually organizing the meetups and the user groups all over Scotland. And they're coordinating and talking and chatting and, and it's, it's, it's phenomenal. They do a lot of work um, and it's you know, from their soul that they're doing this because uh, they're, just, they're just good people. So make sure you shake their hand and say thank you um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I recognize a handful of other speakers from other conferences I've been to as well. All right, so Josh Holmes. We have only bits and pieces of information, but what we know for certain is that at some point in the early 21st century, all of mankind was united in celebration. We marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. AI, I mean artificial intelligence. <laughs> yes, I mean artificial intelligence. And that was 20 years ago. But you know, this is the problem with AI and ML and so on and so forth is that it's deep, dark magic, right? And really, you know, what's, what's the old quote? Any technology that is sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. That is what I'm gonna try and dispel today is dispelling the magic 
and hopefully breaking this down for everybody in the room so that you guys can have conversations about machine learning and AI and understand what it is and have common terminology with people who are data scientists. Any data scientists in the room? Good, I've got nobody to keep me honest. <laughs> Woo! So I can say anything I want to. <laughs> All right, but this, this, is, this is a, um, a, a, a real conversation, really. I mean, you know, it's one of those, it's in the comic, but you know, you kind of laugh and cry because it's true, right? And you know, so, so for those in the back, sitting all the way in the back, hopefully, can you guys read it? So far back there, all right? All right, good. You know, when a user takes a photo, we should have an app that is able to tell them if they're in a national park. Oh yeah, that's a simple GIS lookup, no problem, couple hours, <laughs> fantastic, that's great. And I want to know if there's a bird in it. Yeah, that's going to be five years in a PhD. The hell? <laughs> what? And nobody understands, I say nobody, people who are outside of the, the, the machine learning space don't understand why that's a leap and why that's a jump. And the reality is that that is becoming less of a jump as time goes on. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. But this is what I want to try and break down is why, why is that a jump and, and, and talk about that a little bit. So this is the world that data scientists, machine learning experts live in. And I'm gonna use those terms a little bit interchangeably. And they're, they're not quite interchangeable, but they're, they're close, right? Data scientists of yesteryear would take vast volumes of data, and by vast volumes of data, I'm talking about thousands of rows of data, and they would go through it by hand. Right, and um, has anybody seen The Accountant, the movie The Accountant? Um, and, and The Accountant, uh, he goes through all the books by hand and you know, and, you know, the financial records and so on and so forth and, and he's able to work magic as he goes through all these by hand and sort out all the numbers and so on and so forth. He's a data scientist, right? And that is a data, an old school data scientist where they were doing all this on paper. Well, these days, data scientists are no longer doing it on paper, really. Data scientists these days are not working with thousands of rows. They're now working with terabytes worth of data, okay? Who remembers their first terabyte hard drive? Okay, I'm gonna pick somebody randomly. You had your hand way up over here. When was your first terabyte hard drive? Uh, no, 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 in the back, the black shirt there, it says PSA 8 on PSR? PSR 8. A few years back. Yeah. Okay. So I remember the first time I saw a terabyte hard drive, and it was the big lacy. Okay, the Big Lacy was actually a, a housing that had several hundreds of megabytes, uh, uh, or, or sorry, hundreds of gigabyte uh, uh, hard drives in a housing and put behind a software layer that made it look like a terabyte. But the first Lacy, Big Lacy that I saw was a terabyte hard drive and it was three grand and it was about 10 years ago. Okay, now I can go on Amazon and I can pick up a two terabyte thumb drive for under a hundred dollars. So US dollars, so not even real currency. <laughs> the, so, you know, so, so the amount of data that we're able to capture is exponentially growing, right? I now have customers that are producing 62 terabytes an hour, and they want a seven year retention on this. <laughs> That's a lot of storage. And are you sure you want seven years? They're like, yeah. Okay, we'll get there. Um, but 62 terabytes an hour. And so, so you know, the, the expanse, there's not a human alive, not even the accountant, the mythical accountant, could go, go through that much data. It's just, it's just, it's impossible to keep up with. So you have to have machines to do that. And so the data scientists are now doing machine learning. Any of the real data scientists. Now they start on paper and they prove out hypothesis on paper, but then for real work, they go, they go to machines, right? And so 
the first thing that they want to find out is, what is the problem that I am solving? Okay? The, the problem that I see with a lot of companies that are getting into machine learning is they actually start down here in the bottom with, let's find the data. Let, let's find the patterns and so on and so forth. We've been collecting all this data for all these years. I'm sure there's a pony in that pile over there somewhere. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'm keeping all this data because I'm sure that there's something in there. This is the underpants gnome theory. Is anybody South Park fans? Or, or am I too old for, okay, there's a people, few people that are old enough. Frank's not. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 there, was a, there was a thing in South Park. Um, they, they, most of the show is deplorable. I'm just, just going to say that. But this I thought was hysterical. The, the, and I've seen, I don't know. I work a lot with startups. And I mean, a lot with startups. Conservatively, I've seen 8,000 business plans in the last 15, 20 years. And I'd say probably half of them follow this pattern. And this is the underpants known pattern. Pattern, you know, step one, collect all the underpants. Step three, profit. We're still working on step two. <laughs> and so most people, when they, when they start thinking about machine learning and big data and so on and so forth, well, well we're capturing a lot of data, and so we're going to find the patterns in that, and, and, and then that's going to solve all of our problems. Really? Are you sure? Because what problem do you actually have? That's actually where you need to start, is what is the problem that I am trying to solve? And so real data scientists will spend years thinking about what is the problem that they are trying to solve. Once they figure that out, then what information do I need? In order to solve this problem, what information do I need? Right? And then they step into the next one, which is now, how do we find the patterns and identify the patterns in that data so that we can solve that problem? And once we've done that, now we're gonna say, did I, actually, did I actually get an answer? Is, is that answer actually what I need for, for my, sorry, the shine just blinded me there. Sorry, Frank, just picking on Frank over here. The follically, here, stand up, Frank. <laughs> Hi, Frank. So he took off his hat, and I had to pick on him. Yeah. Anyways, the, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is, you know, where people start with data and they want to solve their problem, but they didn't figure out what problem they had before they started collecting data. So let's go back to that XKCD comic. If I want to know if a picture has a picture of a bird in it, but all I've got are cat videos, I'm not going to be able to solve the problem. And so knowing that I want to find out if there's a bird in the photo, I now know that I need a bunch of photos with birds in them so that I can train my models to look for birds. Okay, does that make sense? All right, hopefully that's not like rocket science or anything, unlike the wake up, which was rocket science, folding the paper airplanes. I was, to be honest, I was a little sad that we didn't have the moment where all the airplanes went launching in the air at the same time. We should do that at some point and then collect your airplanes and then do the contest. Problem is, is that if you folded your airplane really well and, and you throw it in the air now, you may not get it back. Maybe somebody else who takes it and goes and claims that awesome prize, right? So <laughs> anyways, so does the, does the model actually solve my problem? Then, you know, the, the, you know I forget who said it, but um, well, actually Mike Tyson uh, says this. He says, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the face, right? <laughs> and the reality is, you know, if my model solves it in the lab, it doesn't mean that it solves it in the real world. So once we deploy this into the real world, we're going to see, does it actually solve my problem? And if it does, woo, how can we make it better? And you turn the crank on it. And if it doesn't, well, back to the drawing board. And, you know, was I asking the right question? And I might be, I might not be, I don't know. But if I wasn't asking the right question, then I need to go fix that. If I was asking the right question, then I'm still not able to solve my problem. Now, 
am I approaching the problem in the right way? Do I have the right data? Do I have the right algorithms? Do I have the right everything else, right? And so this is the world of a machine learning expert. That makes sense? Cool. And so sometimes this is a very quick turnaround. And by quick in machine learning speak, that used to be measured in uh, PhDs. So you know it, it would be a four to five year cycle. That was a quick turnaround. These days, we're actually able to turn things around a lot quicker. And there's a lot more pre-packaged stuff where somebody else has already done the heavy lifting and we can go ahead and, and, and take advantage of it. Um, as an example there, um, facial recognition, actually it turns out that's hard. Just you know, understanding you know, facial recognition is, is, is hard. And you know, they, there's multiple levels of it, right? It's recognizing an individual person, which means that I need pictures of the people that I want to recognize so I can train my model to understand who they are so that then I can recognize them later. Then there's additional layers where you could do say, say well, is it, a, is it a man or is it a woman? How old are they? Are they happy? Are they sad? And start doing sentiment analysis and that kind of stuff. That's, that's hard, just saying. The good news is there are cognitive services, which is, which is you know, somebody who's already done that hard work and offers it up as a service so that you can just call an uh, API and pass it a photo, and it will return you a JSON script with a bunch of data in it you know, that, that, that describes that photo. Cool beans. I like that idea. Um, there are other things where, you know, so, so that's the quickest turnaround is when you find that somebody else has already solved it. <laughs> I like that. Then there are other scenarios where it's harder, and, you know, but we're no longer talking about a five-year stint. We're now talking about months worth of work instead of years worth of work, okay? Because the tools and the processing and the data and everything else has really, really ramped and hit, a, hit an interesting inflection point in the last handful of years. So, actually, I got a curiosity. Um, what was the first AI? Anybody, anybody have a thought on, on, on when that was? What's that? Yes, Elise. Uh, or Elise, sorry, Elise. So Elise was a um, was it was a was an AI, and I'll, I'll put air quotes around that, and I'll explain them why in a, in a minute or two here. Um, and actually, if I go to the next couple of slides here, so we're talking about the different types of artificial intelligence, right? And so this is kind of the big picture, right? AI is the umbrella term, the artificial intelligence, which is this actually, the, the term artificial intelligence comes from the 50s, but before that, in the late 30s, there was this rather brilliant guy named uh, Alan Turing that came up with the concept of artificial intelligence. He just didn't call it that at the time. Um, but in the 50s, the, the term came about, and the first AI was created. And it was, uh, this was late 50s, early 60s. Um, and what it was is it was a, uh, effectively a chat bot that you would type in a phrase and it would uh, use string replacements and other interesting things and it acted like a kind of low grade um, uh, psychologist, right? And so, you know, you, you type in, uh, I'm mad. And it would respond, um, what are you mad about, right? But if you had typed in, I'm happy, it would say, what are you happy about? It was just doing string replacement and that kind of stuff, right? And it's looking up the parts of speech and doing some simple string replacement and that kind of stuff. It wasn't really um, crazy intelligent, but it gave that appearance. And as long as you stayed in the, the vague and generic world, it, was, it actually would, would fool people pretty well. And it was the first one that came close to passing the Turing test. And the Turing test, so Alan Turing's concept and vision of this was that we would have an artificial intelligence that would be able to fool another human into thinking that it was actually a human as well. You could have this conversation with it. And there's some of that, that is, that's really interesting and we're seeing the, the onslaught of that and, and, and people approaching that you know, as, as time goes on. 
How many people have an iPhone? Okay, keep your hands up. How many people have an Android phone? Oh, no, 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 keep the iPhone people, usually keep your hands up too, right? All right, that's almost everybody. Who has something else? What do you have? Blackberry, hey, he still exists. <laughs> Woohoo! He's got two of them. So I know a lot of people that carry like a Blackberry because that's what's required by work and then they carry a phone that they actually use. Um, but you're carrying two Blackberries? Hats off, respect. I, I, <laughs> that's awesome. So for everybody else, <laughs> You have one of these in your pocket, right? So Cortana, Siri, um, uh, the, the, and, and Alexa, and, uh, and OK Google, all of these are artificial intelligences that are you know, personal assistants, and they do a passable job of being able to have a conversation-ish. Right, if you stay within their realm and don't ask them too many eccentric questions and don't use a Scottish accent and, um, and things like that, right? So, but we're even getting better there, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> one of the videos, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I laughed a little harder than I probably should have, was uh, how many people have seen the, the, uh, the, the voice-activated elevator? <laughs> if you haven't seen it, go look up Scottish, uh, Scottish uh, uh, voice-activated elevator, and it's, oh my God. <laughs> Freedom! So, so anyway, so that, so, so we're, we're coming so close these days, and it, it's, it's a really exciting time. But this started in the 50s. And in the 50s, we had expert systems. And so the expert systems are things where we program the rules, right? Then machine learning started in the 80s. This is actually when we actually started with real machine learning where we had the machines looking at data and starting to figure out their own rules, right? But we were teaching them along the way by telling them this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong, um, and all right, now that you, now we've told you this is right and this is wrong a bunch of times, you know, think about the child who reaches up and we slap up their hand before they touch the stove. We're that kind of learning, right? We're teaching them along the way. And that's machine learning. And then deep learning, which we'll talk about much more extensively at the end of the talk here, is really the new, new frontier. Where we're, we're no longer teaching the AIs and, and describing things for them. Instead, what we're doing is we're just, we're, just we're, we're the judge now rather than the teacher. And so there's, there's an interesting difference there. But since 2010, the world has just exploded with ML and AI. And there's three big catalysts for that. The first one I've already talked about. And so the first one is what? One more time? Oh, no, no. Somebody over here said it. Data. So just the quantity of data that we're, all, we're able to store and index and process is incredibly vast compared to even a handful of years ago. Right? I mean, a handful of years ago, a one terabyte hard drive was still very expensive, though they, even though they were more common. Nowadays, you can get a you know, three or four or five terabyte hard drive for just about a sheep, right? And that is just continuing to go up. Their, um, IBM came up with a new stick that's actually about the size of this, and, and it is replacing tape drives and that kind of stuff, but it's this size, and it can hold 330 terabytes. Like, what? On this? That's crazy. So, and, now, and, and that's especially crazy because when I was in um, uh, Michigan, uh, one of the uh, guys that uh, went to the coffee shop with me, and it was, you know, one of those just cool guys rode in on his uh, Harley motorcycle every day, and he's in his uh, 80s, but he built one of the first five megabyte hard drives. Like, and, and by, say, by built, I mean with a welding torch. <laughs> he was out there building it and creating the magnetic slabs that were about 80 to 90 pounds a piece. 
uh, it's awesome to be in Europe and be able to use pounds and people understand that mostly. So the, except for Frank, the, uh, <laughs> um, but these very heavy platters and so on and so forth. And it was about the size of a Volkswagen bug. And it was a five megabyte hard drive. And it took three or four people almost a year to build this thing. And <laughs> now, you know, we're able to pull out a thumb drive that has terabytes on it. It's crazy. So data is the first one, and that is just, just ramping. The second one is Moore's Law is catching up for us, right? So Moore's Law, we're actually surpassing it in a lot of ways. And that, so what is Moore's Law? Exponential growth of, actually not processing power, it's actually uh, density of capacitors. All right, but that is equaling processing power, right? Um, you know, so there, I mean, there's, there's a corollary there. But we've also figured out some really interesting things. So machine learning, really it's math, right? I mean, behind the scenes, it's actually just math. And I'll, I'll you know, we'll see this in, in, in the future here. But what are really, what's really good at doing math? Turns out it's graphical processing units. So turns out gaming computers are really good at machine learning. And so machine learning really is a boring game. <laughs> Horrible first person shooter. Um, Storyline's shit, but it's, it, you know, actually works out really well. But this is, this, that's why I carry this laptop. Um, I'm not gonna move it too far. Ah, losing some plugs here. Um, so this is the Razer. And the reason I carry the Razer is it's actually got an NVIDIA 1050 processor in it, or 10, 10 I forget the exact number at this point in time because I'm too jet lagged. But in, it's got a big, in, big ass NVIDIA processor in it. And I, I love that about it because I now have a laptop that I can just carry with me, right? And, and um, oops, we lost the screen. I'm sorry. Everybody over here, move over here. Okay, it's back. Woo. So, um, so that's the so 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 the processors are a getting a whole lot uh, faster and a, and a lot more accessible, and then we also have this thing called the cloud. Anybody heard of it? All right, you're in Scotland. There's lots of clouds, but <laughs> the but but the the, the platform you know the the platform.sh deploys to clouds and so on and so forth. Um, I happen to work for one of the leading cloud providers, Microsoft, and the, um, just in case you forgot, the, uh, um, actually, th there, there is a funny story here with the, the Xbox. Um, I, I'm actually a Sounders fan, and so I started wearing these shirts because I'm a Sounders fan, which is the, the local uh, soccer or football club in, in Seattle, and uh, they're actually pretty good. Uh, they've won the national championship twice now, um, but Xbox sponsored them, and I was all excited. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing the shirt around, and then people started approaching me and talking to me about Halo and other things, and I'm like, yeah, I, I like gaming too, and they're like, Don't, aren't you the producer? And I went, they wait, what? <laughs> Turns out there's another Josh Holmes at Microsoft. <laughs> He's much cooler than I am. <laughs> Uh, he is the C, or was, he retired, uh, not retired, he left and went and is doing his own uh, gaming startup. He came from EA where he created the basketball franchise um, at uh, EA, uh, uh, Electronic Arts. And then he moved to Microsoft and ran Halo for five years and was the senior executive producer over Halo. And I was like, holy shit, you're cool. <laughs> I, I, I will never, never live up to that much coolness. I am far too much of a turbo nerd. So, um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, Microsoft. So, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, there's lots of cloud providers. The really interesting part about these cloud providers is that uh, at least the, the, the big three there that I mentioned, you know, Microsoft, Google, and, uh, and Amazon, are providing GPUs in, in the cloud, right? So you don't have to go out and buy all these GPUs that are probably gonna be deprecated over the next couple of years, go rent them by the hour, right? They're expensive, but you rent them by the hour, <laughs> right? So just go rent them and you get to use the, that processing power to do all the math that you would end up doing, right? And so, um, uh, and, then, and then there's a whole bunch of new and interesting stuff that's coming out um, that is even faster at some forms of math 
and FPGAs are one of those, and Microsoft is, 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 has announced that they are coming out with those soon. And so we're, it's really, really an exciting time to be doing processing of data and doing math against data. And so that's the second big catalyst. And the third big catalyst it really is enabled the turnaround time on the third catalyst is enabled by the first two, the amount of data that we have and are able to store and, and access. And then the amount of processing power is enabling new types of math, right? And so we did a hack fest um, where we went down and, and literally spent a week playing with a, with a company that has a bunch of photos and um, they, we were able to do really interesting things like if you take and go, uh, San Diego, so what, what is people's envisioning of San Diego? What's that? <laughs> so San Diego, sunny beaches, um, you know, dry, deserty, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, lots of kind of um, uh, Spanish architecture and so on and so forth. And you take San Diego plus Seattle, what do you get? you get rainy San Jose, which is really kind of a weird thing to think about, but that's what the computers came up with. We're like, what? But it was really kind of cool to think about. But what was happening was we were using algorithms that were literally 11 days old. When we went into this HackFest, if we had done this HackFest two weeks prior, it would have taken us three months to do it. 11 days before we went into this Hackfest, there was, there was a genius out of Berkeley that came up with this new algorithm, and we went, holy shit, let's try it. And all of a sudden, this weird stuff started coming out of the computers, and we're like, this is cool. I don't know what to do with it yet, but it is cool. And so all, there's all kinds of new math and, and new algorithms that are coming out of all these universities um, because we're able to do that and iterate on it so much faster because we have processors and we have access to data that we never had before. That's cool. So those three things are driving this incredible ramp that we've seen in the last really five or six years, okay? And that is in turn driving a bunch of tooling changes. And so the tooling is becoming a lot easier and a lot more accessible. It turns out that you don't have to go uh, learn Scala to do this anymore, right? No offense to Scala. How many people know Scala in the room? Handful, right? So no, the, I'll tell you now, the rest of you don't have to go learn it in order to do machine learning. It's a cool language. I like it. However, it's a tough, tough ramp up to get there but you can actually go do most of the machine learning that you want to do in Python or .NET or Java or you know, Ruby or, or PHP or whatever you want to do it in, right? So pick your language and the tooling is coming along. And in fact, there's actually quite a bit of machine learning where you don't even have to do programming. Instead, you can drag and drop, here's my data sources and I'm going to try this algorithm. And I'm going to drag out a different algorithm. And I'm going to drag out a different algorithm. And, oh, and, and, and R was the other big machine learning language. It, more coffee. So, um, and then you can drag in a Python or an R script or something like that and, and you know, do a little more scrubbing, a little more processing and so on and so forth on it. And, you know, but you, you can do very little programming and get some really astounding results because the tooling is coming along so fast and so exciting these days. I love being alive right now. This is a cool time, right? And I thought that 10 years ago, wow, this has gone fast. So I thought that 10 years ago, and I thought that 20 years ago, and I just get, keep getting more excited. So it's a good time. All right, so let's talk about the different types of machine learning. So this is the first uh, actual attempt that I made at, uh, at, at an AI, right? And so this was in 94, I, this, was, this was one of the first ones that I built. I built a, the, a world-class tic-tac-toe player, right? And my tic-tac-toe player, uh, at, at, at a certain uh, point, I got it to where it never lost. It didn't always win, 
but it never lost. It was awesome, right? And, but what it was, is it was actually it was a state machine, right? And so the bottom you can see the state machine, right? And so the state machine is if the player has moved to 1-1 one, one and 3-2 three, and 3-3 three, three, and, and, and the computer has moved to 1-2 and 2-2, two, 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 it doesn't matter which order they moved in there, if that is the state that we are in now, then the move is 3-1, okay? It's a state machine. Right? And I programmed all the rules. Right? And, so, and, and then I watched people play it, and I logged how they beat it, and then I went back and fixed the rules so that they couldn't beat it that way again. And iterating on it manually over time meant that I, could, I got to where it was, it was, it was unbeatable. Right? I, and I, I, I left it out there for almost a year internal to the company that I was at, and, uh, and nobody beat it for a year. It's pretty awesome. I was pretty excited about this. Is this machine learning? No. This is an expert system. Okay? And so rules-based, you know, me as the human came up with all the rules. Okay? Remember Goldilocks? Okay? Goldilocks goes into, the, into the, the forest and wanders into a cabin, and she tries the three different porridges, and the, the first one, the dad's is too hot, the mom's is too cold, but the son's is just right. Right? Everybody remember that story? All right, very good. And so, if I have, if my porridge is 180 degrees, by the way, by the way, this is in Fahrenheit, because <laughs> if this was centigrade, we'd all be dead. I'm just saying. So this is in Fahrenheit. Um, so if I've, if, if I've got one that's 180, going back to here, is that too hot, too cold, just right? We don't know. We don't know. And so what do we do? More data. More data is a good answer. But if we had just trained it with these three items, Right? What's going to happen is that the, the algorithm is going to come back and say, you know, something roughly, you know, one of these, um, roughly there's a 50% chance or, or, you know, that, that it's, that it's uh, just right and a 40% uh, uh, ch chance that it's too hot and then something we don't know. Right? And it's it's going to come back with percentage chances. It's not going to tell me definitively, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's, it's whatever. It's going to give me a percentage accuracy uh, of what it thinks. I think I'm 60% accurate in saying that it is just right. Okay? And so that is, um, uh, you know, because 180 is closer to 160 than it is to 212. Right? Um, and so the reality is we wouldn't train it with three. We would train it with hundreds of thousands of rows, potentially, and or use as much data as we could. And what we do is we would split the data into two sets. And so one set would be uh, our, our training data. This is the data that we're going to give the computer and tell the computer that it is, um, you know, th th go learn from this. And then we're going to hold in reserve some questions where we know the answer so that we can ask the computer and test it and say, are you right, are you wrong, right? And, and, and there's a simple and easy reason for this, okay? Frank, yes. A equals two. Equals got it? Yeah. Okay, what is A? Two. See, he got it right. Does he know anything? Not really. <laughs> however, however, he guessed right. Now, if I had training data in the background and I said, what is A? What is A? Two. Two, right. What is B? I know the answer to B. He doesn't know the answer. Five. Five. He's wrong. That means I need to give him more data, right? So that's on me to go fix him. <laughs> so <laughs> anyways, so what we end up with is we end up with these features, and the features are the domain knowledge, right? And so the domain knowledge is the item, the temperature, and so on and so forth. And then we have labels, so too hot, too cold, just right. Those are what we're actually going to be testing against and so on and so forth. And what the computer actually does is it scatter plots this and then draws categorization buckets and so on and so forth. 
and then it does an evaluation on it, right? And the evaluation, we're actually going to take slices of this and actually play through it and come up with this, what is called a confusion matrix, right? Paul, can I steal an extra couple of minutes here? All right, great. Um, so the uh, confusion matrix, and, and it is called the confusion matrix, not just because it's confusing. There's actually a term for it behind the scenes that I forgot now. But true positive means it was true, so it was just right, and we predicted that it was just right, right? Uh, true negative means it wasn't just right, and we predicted that it was either too hot or too cold, and that's good. Right, because we predicted that it wasn't just right. False positives mean we predicted that it was just right, and it's actually either too hot or too cold. Right, and then false negatives, same thing. Right, you know, it it it, it is not that, but we predicted that it was just right, and that those are bad, in the case of the porch. Right, and so then we talk about precision, and precision is the true positives divided by the condition of being true. Right? So that top row there, there's, uh, sorry, this row here, false positives, uh, meaning that we didn't get it right, and true positives, meaning that we, um, uh, that we did get it right, and those are the positives. We were 50% precision. Recall is the actual condition positive, and, and so there's nine of those, the top row, and so that's 44% recall. So remembered the correct thing 44% of the time. And then there's accuracy, which is how many times did it get it right? So true positive and true negative divided by how many things did we feed it overall, right? And so these are really interesting and, 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 and uh, important to get your head around. And it's also important to guess right, okay? And by guessing right or missing on the correct side, um, the, the, you're going to be safer, right? And so... In a autonomous driving scenario, what is safer if you're not sure? Going faster or stopping? Hopefully stopping, <laughs> right? So if you think that you've got gangrene in your leg and you're about to amputate the leg, do you want to err on the side of caution and not cut off the leg? Or do you want to err on the, on the side of caution and cut the leg off regardless of whether or not there's, there's uh, gangrene? Don't know. I'm not the doctor, <laughs> right? But if I think that I've got a cold and I've actually got influenza, that's a bad thing, right? I, I guessed wrong and, I, and, I, and playing too safe there means that I'll end up very sick, right? On the other hand, if I think somebody's in cardiac arrest and I'm about to shock them with the paddles, <laughs> I, want, I, I, want, I want to be safe. <laughs> so I, I'm gonna double check and triple check and quadruple check to make sure that they don't have a pulse before I hit them with the paddles. That makes sense? Okay, so you want to guess in, or sorry, if you're going to miss, you want to miss in the right direction. So in the case of our porridge, it is better to falsely predict that something is too cold than it is to falsely predict that something is too hot. Is that, did I get that right? Oh, sorry, other way around. That is the jet lag kicking in. So, but, but it's a, if, if I get a bowl of porridge and it was predicted that it was, uh, it was just right, and it actually turns out that it was too cold. That's okay, I just put it back in the microwave and I'm, I'm, I'm fine. If I get a bowl that was predicted to be uh, just right and it turns out that it was way too hot, molten lava, um, that, that's bad, right? That's gonna hurt me, right? So we wanna miss on the correct side. A equals two, B equals four. Now you know, what is C? Needs more data. That is absolutely correct because what is C, what is D? C could have been, with, with the, the first two, could have been eight, could have been 16, right? So it could have been six, eight, or 16. Six if we're adding, uh, you know, by two. Uh, it could have been eight if we were multiplying. Could have been 16 if we were squaring. Very few people do that. So largely it would have been 40, 40, 20, or something like that. Um, and so it's, it, sorry, it scatter plots and then draws a line and then starts predicting where it is on the line and that kind of stuff. And that's a regression. Specifically, it's a linear regression, right? Those are all what are called supervised learning. 
This, this one here is called unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning, I've got a whole bunch of data about a whole bunch of different condiments, right? And I'm gonna start just by asking the machine, hey, tell me what you know about these things. And it's gonna start looking at this going, wow, mayonnaise is really high calorie and ketchup down at the bottom is very low calorie uh, or medium calorie and it's low grams of fat, okay? Uh, that sounds like a good thing. Carbs, on the other hand, ketchup is high and mayonnaise is zero. Huh, that's interesting. Um, and grams of protein, if I'm looking for protein in my diet, if I'm muscle building, raw, um, turns out that ranch dressing has actually the highest protein. Or no, no, sorry, Thousand Island has the highest protein. That's interesting. Okay, cool. Um, which of these is healthy? That's a different question, right? So what we have done here is we have started to go through and categorize things. And the machines can do that without, without human intervention. And that's awesome. This is called unsupervised learning and clustering, which is really cool. We can also do anomaly detection. If we say all these clusters and then all of a sudden we see something with 6,000 calories per gram, it's like, oh, there's, wow, there's something wrong there. I don't know what it is. We should probably go look, right? So anomaly detection. The last one I'm gonna talk about is, how do you recognize a duck, right? And so, <laughs> take a bill, right? And that is actually, that's a, that's a duck, right? What about this one? Is that a duck? I hear some yes, I hear some no's, right? It is a duck, but it's a rubber ducky, right? It's a different kind of duck, right? And then, what about this one? Hey, it's a goose. How do you know that? The website from the beginning and you had it goose here. Yeah. That was the website killed at fuckinggoose.com. Geese are mean bastards, I'm just saying. Um, but so this is actually a Canadian goose. That's that, that's awesome. So in the old days, and this goes back to the XKCD uh, thing, what we would do is um, a, a human would go through and describe what the features were of something, and then they would, you know, and, and, but it was, it was, it turns out it's hard to describe a goose. It's hard to describe a duck, and what are the differences between those, and how do you teach a machine that, right? Um, what about this one? Hey! <laughs> A-level's over here. So, it is a platypus, right? So, what we would do is uh, what, we, what we do, what we used to do and what we do now, but we let the machines do it now, is we would have a input layer, in number of hidden layers, the highest is uh, ResNet 152, it's 152 layers, and I'll talk about what those are in a minute, and an output layer, right? And so the hidden, so, so I feed it pictures, and the output is I'm scoring it, right? And, and the output is, it's gonna classify it as a duck or a goose, right? And so um, the, the hidden layers, like five layers in we say, is it a bird? Okay, and, and, and 10 layers in we go, is it a waterfowl? Oh, it's got web feet, it's a waterfowl. Okay, and then we go another 20 layers in and we go, what kind of waterfowl? <laughs> and along the way, we're describing different little features and so on and so forth. So it's looking and saying, does it have a beak? Does it have web feet? Does it have wings? Does it have, you know, et cetera. Well, over time, what we did is we said, um, and I'm over time, Paul's checking the schedule here. Uh, <laughs> he's very subtle that way. It's actually really well done. Um, but over time, what we did is we stopped telling the computer what the features were. Instead, we just told it, are you right or are you wrong? Think about a child. Car, no, that's a truck. Oh, okay. And so the next time it sees an El Camino, anybody know what an El Camino is? Yeah, and he goes, oh, that's a car. Or, sorry, that's a truck. And you go, actually, that's a car. And you go, really? And then they see a lorry and they go, what's that? <laughs> right? So, you know, there's a whole, there's an evolution there. But as we're teaching the child there, you know, we're not, we're not teaching it the features of it. We're just teaching it, this is what it is. I'll let you figure out how, to, how you want to featureize it yourself. Right? And so that is actually what deep learning is. That's all it is. Pretty simple. Um, uh, I mean, it's incredibly complex, but it's a simple concept at the top. And then this last one, personally, I find this really fun and interesting. Um, so the evaluator side, 
for this side here, for this side of the audience, and that side over there, for that side. Um, the evaluator, we just trained the way that I just talked about. You know, so, so you know, what's happening is, is that we're teaching, um, you know, uh, teaching it how to evaluate and spot a fake, for example, right? And so we teach it, here's how you spot a, a uh, fake Renoir. Right, and so we feed it a whole bunch of pictures of you know Renoir photos and or sorry paintings, and then we feed it a bunch of fakes, and we teach it to spot the fake. Then what we do is we have the creative, and this is similar to what I was talking about with the the rainy San, San Jose, is the creative is creating what it thinks are Renoirs and then feeding those to the evaluator. And when it gets to the point where it can fool the evaluator, success. We now have a creator that is able to, to, uh, to beat the, the evaluator. Where this is being used in real life is um, we're using that, you were creating, doing the evaluator to look for fraud detection uh, issues, right? So, you know, I swipe my credit card, um, you know, I go down the, down the road here and I swipe my credit card at a restaurant um, and there's a, there's a flag that goes up that says, he's in Scotland. <laughs> and, and they look back across my credit history and go, oh, actually he goes to Scotland quite a bit. <laughs> okay, that's probably okay. Um, you know, oh, and, and, and so on and so forth. The, so they, they've trained an evaluator to detect fraud issues with credit cards and so on and so forth. Then what they do is they have a, a creator start trying to create new and interesting ways to beat that fraud detection. And if they beat it, they do what I did with the tic-tac-toe game. They go back and they fix their evaluator to be able to detect that new way of, de of, of beating the fraud detection so that they've got this generative adversarial network that is making safer fraud detection over time. The bad news is the bad guys are also doing the same thing. So it's an arms race, and it's a really interesting arms race. We've got lots of things, uh, you know, a, a, and as I'm over uh, time, uh, feel free to come grab me afterwards. Uh, but we've got lots of different tools and things and offerings uh, at Microsoft. Um, and I'm Josh Holmes. Thank you very much. Thank you.